Hi, I'm Bitsy Tandem, creator of Isekai Production Studios and EOTerra Entertainment. You can find me on EOTerra.com or at Bitsy the Alien on Facebook and Instagram. I hope you are ready to talk about anime and manga because I make the awesome manga Otome no Henso Made in Disguise new game. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented individual. She is one of two amazing, talented people, I should say, for this particular manga. Joining us from all the way, way, way across the pond and in a different time zone, as usual, we are joined today by the ever-talented Bitsy Tandem, creator of... Maiden in Disguise new game. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing good. I woke up nice and early and the sun is shining, so it's wonderful. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person and what you're bringing to Two Keeks Talking today, tell us who you are and what you're all about. So I am the lead creator of Maiden in Disguise, Otome no Hinso in Japanese, and we have our first book released right now in English and Japanese. And for those of you who don't know, I am in Japan. <laughs> My husband and I make this together. It's kind of our baby, our child, our dream project. We also have a production studio called Isekai Production Studios. Eotera Entertainment is kind of our uh, all-encapsulating thing that has a uh, Otome no Henso with also Tsukiyame no Kumbujin is another manga that we do. And a few more are coming this year, actually. So. Lots of fun stuff on our make-believe planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. Are the universes connected uh, as well, or are they all separate? So we've got a multiverse called the Stranger Realms. At the moment, we're focusing on one planet in particular called Eotera. And Made in the Disguise takes place in modern-day Eotera. Tsukiyame no Kumbujin takes place in a historical past and is kind of very samurai Japan-inspired. We want to hit past, present, future on Eotera, as well as um, do some stuff that's kind of more like Second Earth or just really weird and totally off the wall. So we've, we've got some plans for some stuff that's uh, out there in our multiverse, but that's coming later, so I can't tell you. Just means you have to come back on the show and talk about it. That's, that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. In terms of being a creative person, that you are and especially an, an artist and a writer at that as well too you know what is your creative kryptonite drawing the comics <laughs> is really hard uh i was never like i was never that kid in school who could draw i took a crowbar to my like right arm and forced it out of me over the past 10 years to learn how to draw because i'm like you know mangaka in japan they write and draw so i was like I have to do that too, so I have to learn. And it's been a struggle uh, and an uphill battle. And I feel like last year is when I finally started getting good at it. So it's been like 10 years of crap. <laughs> <laughs> what is the most misunderstood aspect about being a mangaka that maybe people that don't understand that genre or of comic, uh, you know, like ordinary people deal with? So most people, I don't know why but most people immediately think it's for kids so they're mm. like oh i've got a 10 year old grandson who would love this and i'm like it's not really for kids i mean there's there's sexual implications in the very first prologue chapter and i'm like i don't know if you want to show this to your 10 year old i mean i don't want to stop you from buying my book but just know that this is like pg-13 tv-14 like we don't cross that edge, but we'll get close to it sometimes. And that, that was the one thing I, I loved about reading the manga itself here. Um, like I said earlier, before the show started, you know, I, I loved the characters. I loved the, the art style was beautiful and, and the writing just kept me engaged no matter what. Looking at yourself as a, as a comic creator specifically, what was maybe the first manga that, that you read that you were like, I want to do this as a career? There was actually two throughout high school. I was mm -hmm. religiously reading Bleach and Vampire Night. 
And so those were like my two biggest inspirations. The art was just beautiful. I really liked the stories. So I kind of, I really liked the mix of like action and, you know, epic sword fights, plus like the love and the school life and the like doki doki <laughs> kawaii anime stuff. So uh, Maiden in Disguise really brings both of those together, I think, because it, it follows Elrond Agrenar in the video game as like an actual character and his story and Eliana in real life going to school and her story. So we've got both worlds. And there was a good separation, but you still found time to, to merge the world, so to speak, together as well too. And I was disappointed that it, it stopped where it stopped and which means I, I want to read more. So, so when's the next volume coming up? We are kickstarting that this October. Big news, actually, we have an art team now, so I'm not alone. Aaron does the 3D backgrounds, and I outsource some of the other prettier backgrounds from other artists, and then I have drawn the characters all by myself, but now we have a storyboard artist, I'll be doing the inks still, and then we have a colorist. So this should go a lot faster, and it should hopefully not take me two years. <laughs> So now that you have a, a team itself, you know, uh, were there certain individuals that are part of the team that you, you can talk about, or is this still like kind of in the planning stages? Yeah, we officially announced them as a part of the team uh, on our last Kickstarter, which has like three days left. So I doubt any of you will have time to jump on that. But <laughs> if you go on to the MidBits Kickstarter, uh, they're under the team, so you can find them and find their social links. I don't want to butcher their names. So I think Hemlock, I don't know their actual tags, but she's the colorist. She's on Twitter, and uh, she's fantastic. And then uh, Joy, last name, I don't want to butcher it, uh, but I met her on Facebook, and she's going to be doing the storyboard sketching. They're really awesome. I've really liked working with them so far. We're going to start kickstarting book two as chapters because paying them is going to be a lot, you know, more cost to me than just doing it myself. So we're going to do chapters at a time and we're all going to see how fast we can make this thing. And they're very excited. They really loved the book and I really like their art. So it's going to be great. So then in terms of the, the process itself here, you said it's going to speed up. What are some things that that you struggled with in the first two years that, you know, you're, you're finally relieved to get off your plate. Uh, storyboarding for sure is something I suck at. Like mm -hmm. even learning art was a struggle, but I just don't have the eye for like the paneling. Every time I make one, Aaron would come up and be like, that's terrible. That's not what I envisioned at all. And we just fight over the paneling all the time. It's like, I want it to be like this. And I'm like, I don't want to draw that. That's a terrible angle. Why would you do this to me? <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to let Joy just do that and take it off our plates. And then what, what happens happens. So then as you've been writing this out and, and, and storyboarding and, and building this world together itself what has been the hardest part the beginning the middle or the end of your your process so for the writing specifically oh i don't know i i like the writing process a lot um it's kind of my favorite part we haven't gotten to the end yet with like the script that's something i want to do this summer actually is completely finish the script all the way to the end we have plans for the ending we just can't quite we haven't quite decided yet. There's like, this is a really good idea and this is a really good idea, but I am not entirely sure which one we really want to go with. That's been a little difficult because depending on how we decide to end it is going to affect the middle. And so <laughs> we've just been putting it off and I have a bunch of work to do this summer before we launch in October. What was the, the first seed of the story for for Maiden in Disguise that kind of popped into your head that would eventually eventually develop into what we're currently seeing today? Actually, a really funny story. So I was coming back from Go Daiko Con in Michigan way back mm -hmm. years ago, like, gosh, 2013. I just had this idea in the car. I was like, what if there's this gamer girl that everybody thinks is a guy and she's, you know, falls in love with her best friend, but her best friend is 
doesn't know she's a girl and just like shenanigans because it was going to be a gag manga at first and i was just like in the car writing i have motion sickness too so it was like real commitment there to write in the car for me <laughs> yeah and then i showed that to a couple of my friends and they were like hey this thing called Tapastic is really cool and you could like make money off of this comic that you want to do. And I was like, well, my art skills aren't good enough to do the comic I actually want to do. So yeah, let's do this. Let's practice. Let's do a gag manga. And that was Maiden in Disguise version one, which is out there and findable. And I please don't read it. <laughs> So is this version two then that, that I write or version three or, or yes. six or whichever version is. two, that's the, the new game is like started over. Then in terms of being a creator, especially with this story itself, then what was the most important lesson that you've learned so far that has maybe either improved your process or maybe improved yourself as a person? Hmm. Ooh, that is a hard one. I would say baby steps taking it small bites at a time so I, I try i get so excited and i try and do too much too soon and then you end up with sloppy work a lot of stress a lot of stuff you got to fix baby steps small kickstarters you know small goals do multiple small goals plan plan a little roadmap don't try to conquer the universe all at one go <laughs> Biting off more than you can chew is never a good thing in, in life yeah. or, or, or comics, I'm sure. Yeah, I've had a few times where I've had to like step back and be like, that that was too much at once. And I need to like reevaluate, like be like, okay, for my mental health, we need to do it in this order and do one step at a time. And then it'll actually produce a really good, really good outcome. Being in Japan and, and being in, in such an amazing not only culture but i think work ethic is is completely different from um north america in general but what's a, what's the most important quality of a of a manga artist and writer in comics today or in manga today i should say and how does that mm. translate to what you've created the work ethic here is a lot different they don't really take any days off they're very like almost robotic and like how much they have to work and it's terrible because like these manga cut they're getting sick they're overworked they're exhausted and i see that and i go i don't want that to be my life you know i'm i'm creating my passions and my love and i don't want that to kill me i don't want that to be you know my death and my stress and my, and my sickness you know so i see that and i take that as like a that's not what i'm gonna do i'm gonna try and approach this from a much more healthy work ethic, take days off and take those breaks. Being here, I've learned a lot of really great stuff. Like you would never have thought. It's one thing to say, like, I make a manga, but it's another thing to bring it to somebody in Japan and be like, would you consider this a manga? And they say, yes, that's a manga. You make manga. That's awesome. So that's been very validating. Because in America, it was always, oh, you do that weird Japanese stuff. And I'm like, uh-huh, I do. <laughs> but here they're like, wow, you, you make manga. I love manga. Manga's everywhere. It's just comics. And sometimes they'll be like, they'll try and distinguish Western comics from Japan comics. But most of the time, like, they just say manga. It's just a word. So what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? I would say I learned that very early on. My mom was very intentional with teaching me how you talk and, and what you read and what you consume can affect you. I've never been very good at language personally. I've spent a lot of time going through those like YouTube courses of like how to speak better, how to interact with humans and stuff like that. So um, it's been a struggle because communicating is key like especially when you have an art team uh, i've had a couple times where i've had to not necessarily fire somebody but we've had to split ways because our communication was just not working i know that i can't communicate as well as people need so i have to find people who understand me to work with and that's the great thing about the team i have now is from what we have already tested they understand what I'm saying. They're picking up what I'm putting down. And that is really important. 
because I'm, I'm not so good with the fancy words and the and the nice email like that explains every little detail of everything like I I need you to kind of meet me halfway because I'm so dyslexic and it's just like and I'm so awkward so <laughs> Yeah, language does have power and it's something you need to be aware of. And looking at what you what you've created so far, what was the hardest scene for you to write? Mm, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't had I haven't had a part where I've been like I can't do this, you know, especially being a team with Aaron. Mm -hmm. Um if I get stuck, he has an idea and if he gets stuck. I have an idea. Like there's a very good ebb and flow. And so far we haven't been like super stuck except for on like the ending. We have like three very solid ending ideas now. It used to be like, that's four, three very solid ending ideas now. <laughs> so we just need to pick one. I, you know, I always find nameology fascinating because, because if you see a name of a character that someone has created, it kind of gives you a, a little glimpse as to their creative process. So in terms of the names that you've created for, uh, of course, volume one here, mm -hmm. uh, how did you come up with some of the names? And, um, you know, why is your lead character's name specifically as you created it? So that's actually, I'm really glad you asked that question because I am very specific with my names. Like I, I named them these things for, you know, reasons. Like I spell Eric the way I spell it for a reason. I spell Ellie the way I spell it for a reason, you know? So specifically, I mean, you take Eliana Adelaide, her initials are the same as Elrond Agrenar. I wanted her to have a name where her nickname could sound androgynous as well as confuse the reader. So her nickname is Ellie, but it's spelled Eli. And that's a boy's name. So it's like, that's the point. And people are always like, this is confusing. What's her name? And I'm like, that's the point. I want you to be confused because she's confused and the people around her are confused. And that's the journey we're going to go on. So it's, uh, take my names very seriously. And I like to say that the characters tell me their names. I don't name the characters. So that's kind of something I, you know, just something that you sit with and you listen to and you until the character tells you their name. <laughs> Hopefully it's not a one-sided conversation all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got so many voices in my head. Who knows who's talking back? <laughs> hey, as long as it helps you create a process, it really doesn't matter who many, how many are up there. <laughs> Being in Japan that you that you are, and it's a country that I've always wanted to visit for a very, very long time, especially with the mass consumption of media that is there as well, too. What is the, your most underappreciated novel or manga or maybe TV show that, you know, people should maybe take a look at? So I really love this. It's an anime and a manga and both are fantastic. And you should do, you should definitely check out both individually because they offer different things. It's called Dimension W mm -hmm. and uh, nobody has heard of it. I haven't like in America, in Japan, like I haven't found anybody who's been like, oh, I love Dimension W. Like it is so good though. And um, it's a sci-fi. It follows a robot girl and like, a techno samurai type grizzled grumpy old man and uh i love it it's so good so check out dimension w how long have you been in japan i've been here almost three years this this august will be three years we got here because my husband got on the jet program so he's been teaching english and i've been working like once or twice a week at the local bakery because that's what my dependent visa allows <laughs> and then just you know, drawing book two, book one, I suppose that took up a lot of time, but, um, it's crazy. We're way out in the middle of nowhere. We're in the countryside. So we don't have that like typical Japan life that everyone's like, oh, you you're in Tokyo and there's so many awesome anime things and you can go to, and it's like, no, no, I, there's rice fields and mm -hmm. the oceans behind us. So that's cool. But <laughs> yeah, it's very Inaka is the word for countryside. So it's like we're Itsumo Inaka, very, very out there. Yeah, it's a cute little town. We're, we're ready to go somewhere a little bigger. 
What's the most recent literary pilgrimage that you've gone on? So I actually just listened to the audiobooks for one of Brandon Sanderson's series, The Stormlight Archive is the one I have been listening to uh, audiobooks for the past couple months. And uh, they are beefy books, man. Those are long audiobooks. <laughs> it's been really emotional. I love Brandon Sanderson's books. He does a lot of good world building. And I've never listened to one that was so dark. Like the first book specifically just is, it's really hard to get through. There were moments I was like, I can't finish this. This is so depressing. Like it was just really gritty too. And um, yeah, I don't really do like super dark. I have a very fragile imagination. So like it gets too vivid. Like if, if you, if you show me one zombie movie, I can't sleep for a month. Like I gotta, I gotta keep my brain safe. So through the books and the character's journey, I was like, I still don't really like the first book specifically, but I understand why he needed to tell that to show the growth of these characters. And I think people struggling with mental health could really find some inspiration there. Yeah, it was really, it was really crazy. And it showed me like how to talk about some of the like mental illnesses and stuff and how to like approach that like conversation with other people. And it was just really eye opening. I'm like, wow, he really put a lot of emotion into it. And uh, that's something I hadn't seen from his works before. Is that going to affect your style of writing or, or creation of your artwork? Mm, I don't think it will impact it in a huge way. Um, when I listen to an audiobook, I tend to get the narrator's voice stuck in my head, though. Mm. And if I write like with the narrator's voice in my head, I will write in the tone of the book. I don't typically do a lot of descriptions. I, I write in a screenplay format. So be like setting, setting, action, and then like dialogue. But sometimes I'll like be like, and he did this and that, and they were in this beautiful room. And I'm like, where did that come from? Oh, it's the little narrator in my head. He's still talking. <laughs> You also mentioned that you're doing a podcast. Tell us what your podcast name is and, and what it's all about as well. So I just started Isekai Interviews. It was actually a, one of the milestones for our last Kickstarter was to start that off. And it took, uh, took a lot of courage. I've been wanting to do something like that for a few years, but I didn't think I could because, you know, social anxiety and talking to people is hard. But after coming on to so many, like you're having me on here, I've built up my courage over the last year and uh, went ahead and went for it. So Isekai Interviews is a world building podcast where I bring on other creators, be it uh, screenplay writers, comic book artists, like anybody who is experience building worlds. And we talk about planets. That's, I love planets. I treat Eoterra is like its own character. That's one of my biggest loves is world building. So I figured why not kind of do that as well as introduce people to some Japanese culture along the way, because the whole isekai is a genre that's well, kind of become a little tired already. And I just kind of want to put a fresh spin on it and tell people like, it's not just a genre. It's also just a regular Japanese word that means other world. I think there's a lot we can explore there. So how did the, the love of world building come about for yourself? I think it has a lot to do with the video games I played growing up. So after we got our first computer, my aunt got her first computer and I would go up the street to her house and play games. We had Morrowind was like our first game. And man, it was so good. I love Morrowind. And there's just so much world building and there's just so much you can explore. A few years later, we got Oblivion. I love that one even more. <laughs> All of that was, it spoke to me very deeply. I think it's a huge part of my person, just like deep in there, those those two games and my experience with those and playing with my cousins growing up. Especially with Japan being a, a mecca of video games as well, too. I'm sure there are some amazing games that are there that we haven't even touched on over here <laughs> that I'm I'm sure I've, I've spoken to you as well, too. Are there any, any you've played recently? The problem with that is I can't read Japanese. <laughs> I can speak it all right, but I can't read it. There are too many kanji and even katakana, I can't seem to get my, it just doesn't stick. Mm -hmm. I don't know, man. 
you shouldn't have three different styles of writing in a language to begin with, but that's a whole other topic. <laughs> um, so yeah, I haven't been able to play any that plus time if I'm not writing or drawing or, you know, marketing. Ugh. Well, I was going to ask how, how social media has been for you in terms of promoting yourself, but it sounds like that's a sore, a sore subject maybe. I hate social media. It's like taking high school interactions and shoving them into word format. And I'm, I just the typing and the people and the talking, and it's just not my thing. Mm. I like being face to face. I, I, if I can see you, it's okay. But as soon as I can't see you and it's just like, here are some letters in a row that might mean something. I don't know. So it's been a struggle. Uh, people don't really resonate with my posts mm. and I don't know how to fix that. And I've decided I'm not going to try anymore. So if I post, I post, if I don't, I don't, if you like my stuff, keep an eye on me because <laughs> I'll forget to tell you about stuff. Oh no. Uh, the good news about this is you can use your podcast to promote yourself that way. And that's the, the better solution to maybe your social media anxiety. Yes. Uh, the podcast has been a lot of fun so far and definitely keep that going. Getting to see people face to face is so nice. And I've been trying to be like, you know, not marketing. Cause when I go onto it, like specifically, like I want to make people read my book. So I have to say these things and I have to put these specific images and it's just stressful and it's just awful. And it's just not my thing. It's like, if I can hire someone to do that one day, fantastic. Until then I'm just going to be myself. And if you don't like it, sorry. And if you do like it, yes, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> But it's difficult. It is difficult to put yourself out there. It's difficult to promote yourself as a creative person because, and especially being Canadian, so I'm like double trouble for that because, you know, we don't like to promote ourselves and we don't like to say, hey, look at the, th look at the thing I did. You know, it's cool. But it wasn't until, you know, you started getting into a flow and into a rhythm and, and especially the fact that you're interviewing other creative people like yourself that have a passion for what they're doing as well too. I think that's, that's a great uh, aspect to showcase because, you know, I don't know anything about world building and I'm sure there are people similar in, in your situation where they're like, Oh, Hey, I love world building. Hey, this is a cool show. You know, it's just a matter of, you know, 140 characters in a Twitter post and away you go. And it's like, look, <laughs> this is the person we're talking to. See, cool. Tag them. And that's all you need. Yeah. Definitely been approaching it with a little bit more of that, just like laid back kind of vibe. Cause, um, I don't know, some people must like it because some people do a very good job and they make lots of sales, but I hate selling my book. And I just, they uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to walk up to you and be like, Hey, buy my book. I don't want, I don't want to make anyone spend money. I come from like very little means and I'm like, I don't want to force you to spend your money on me. If you do want to, I won't stop you though, because I can't make this stuff without cash. Darn you cash. <laughs> Will you be showcasing this at any comic cons uh, in Japan? So I've been wanting to go to comic Hit in uh, Tokyo, as well as some smaller ones around the prefecture, preferably maybe one in Fukuoka, but uh, they've all been canceled. Mm. They're very scared of Corona here. They're very on top of that uh, whole let's not do stuff thing. It's finally starting to get better. And I think comic Hit did go on a few months ago, but that was for the people who were already signed up two years ago, you know, there's a long waiting list. And I don't know if I'll ever get to do that before we have to leave. Cause we've got maybe two more years here. If we're lucky back to that cash thing again, man, Whew. it's a problem. <laughs> I do have some books that will be circulating in Oregon. My distributor, he uh, sets up tables and mm -hmm. he'll be having my books. So he doesn't have it right now. He's at a convention like this weekend. And uh, I was like, that's too short notice. I don't have the money to get you a bunch of copies right now, but I'm like next time. So maybe Rose City, maybe uh, Emerald City, he might be going there. So you might be able to see my books around. I just won't be there. <laughs> at what point are we good enough? Uh, 
Oh, man. <laughs> I haven't reached that point, so I'm not sure. When it comes to making something, you have to just decide it's good enough someday. Like, you have to wake up and be like, my book's good enough, and it's finished, and it's out, and it's time to publish. I don't know. Personally, I think if you can find a balance in your life where you're generally happy and you're doing things you enjoy, even if it's a struggle sometimes, even if it feels like work sometimes, if you're, if you're able to find a point where you can say four days out of the seven, you know, every week, I am genuinely happy. I think that's a pretty decent goal. I think that's that. I don't know if it's good enough. It might be all we can ask for. What in life is beautiful to you? My husband. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love nature. I love the ocean. I think creativity and art is you know, wonderful. I love those moments in life where I personally go 100% into my imagination and just live there for a while. And it's kind of like bliss. It's just like none of the outside world matters. It's just me and these fantasy worlds that are up in here. And you don't have to like not doing anything for anybody, just kind of like relax and get out of planet earth for a while. I think that that's, that's nice. How do you think the birth of creativity was formed? I have no idea. <laughs> I think it's in us. I don't know. I think something about having all these emotions like we can't help but have creative sides i mean even even building houses can be creative everything can be creative even if you don't think you're an artist you could still be an artist at communicating with people you could still be creative in the way you you know code something like everything's creative and i think it's just kind of innate and i think it's always been with us Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Ooh, if I had to pick just one, I would probably say my grandma, because I wouldn't be here if she hadn't pushed me to go after my dreams, despite my dyslexia. She's passed now, but I hope to dedicate a printing press to her one day because she loved books and she was able to publish a couple books and she just wanted me to take over the world. She wanted me to have books everywhere and for everybody to read them. And I think that support and that constant enthusiasm was what pushed me to be able to continue through this path, even when it gets pretty hard. So I think I need to get to that point where I can say, Grandma, look, I did it. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> yeah, she wanted that printing press. She wanted to see me in a building making my own stuff and not not needing anybody else's permission. You know. From a professional standpoint, you have created a, a manga, and you are creating many more in the future too. That you definitely have to come back on to talk about because I would love to have you back on as well too. So professionally, you are successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Hmm. My gut response was no, and I don't think that's a good, healthy thing, but I have really big goals. I want to make movies. I want to make anime. I want to do so much. So it's like one good book out of like the five that I've self-published doesn't say to my inner me that I'm successful. I like to say there's like a little evil bitsy inside me and I try not to listen to her because she's kind of, she's mean to me specifically. Like she doesn't care about the outside world. She's just like my little personal, like, what's it called? Like, yeah. a, I, I don't want to say that because that's a little harsh critic. <laughs> oh, she's you. my personal art critic and she's very picky to her. No, I have not made it yet. I'm not successful. I try to to go at it with like a bit more self love and be like, this is this is a success. Maiden in Disguise Book One is a success, and um, you know, and and we will have more, and it's just a matter of time. And uh, 
So I think I'm on the way to success. I wouldn't say I've quite made it yet, personally. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? That's a good thing to talk about because there have been a lot of failures. I mean, we even talked about the webcomic Maiden in Disguise on Tapastic. Like, that's uh, one of the things that I just like, I consider it a failure. People read it and they like it. And I'm like, bless you. <laughs> to me, that was a trial and an error. Like I needed the experience and I couldn't have got it without it. So thank you for that, you know, webcomic, but you need to go into the fire now. It's time for something else. <laughs> and then there's like the promotion. I feel like I've failed a lot in promoting myself. And I like, I feel like there's so many little missed opportunities that I could have had if I would have just been better at promotion. And so that kind of kills me some days. I have to just write it out sometimes. Sometimes like, like I said, my imagination is very vivid and when it gets dark, it gets very dark. And some days you just have to turn off all the computers, grab your Nintendo Switch and curl up in the bed and write it out. The next day will come. And then when it's there, you'll think a little clearer and you can move on to the next step. I found when I get to the point where I feel like a failure, I need to just kind of stop, take a moment, take a day, maybe a couple days. Because at the end of the week, I'm not a failure and you're not a failure. We're just people and people make mistakes and we can only do the best we can. And we couldn't have known like 10 years ago, I couldn't have told myself, hey, you need to learn how to draw faster, better, like now. Like it's a process and it's going to happen and it sucks. <laughs> That's just life though. I mean, look at everybody. Everybody you know feels like that sometimes. Nobody's perfect. Like I saw this thing the other day that said, don't be jealous of people's when they're winning because you don't know the pain they had to work through when they were losing. And that's so true because like as creators, there have been far more losses that I've had to work through than there have been wins. Maybe one day that will switch, but I think as a creative person, as an artist, we take those losses and we really internalize them and we feel them so much deeper sometimes. You got to give yourself a break. You got to, you got to say, it's okay that I feel this, but I'm going to just take some time for me and do something I love and work through it and deal with the work later. It's a healthy aspect of dealing with self-doubt, dealing with anxiety, dealing with imposter syndrome. I'm sure that's a, a huge factor being a creative mm -hmm. person in general. And we, we all deal with it in our own ways. I'm glad that you're, you're going through it in, in the best way you can. So that, that works out very well. Can only do our best. <laughs> the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a, as a manga artist or writer or creative person in general. Um, you know, maybe they find it through your works currently. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? So, I don't know. It's weird being somebody that inspires other people. I mean, honestly, every single person in the world probably inspires at least one or two other people. That's just how humans work. Seeing that firsthand, posting things and seeing people be like, you inspired me to to follow my dream or, Hey, you inspired me to get up today. You know, like it feels like a, it's a lot of pressure. The best advice that I could give is, um, they are inspired by you for many reasons, not just because they think you're perfect, not just because they want your life or they're jealous. So put out your best work, put out your honest truth. Just understand that those people are going to be inspired by you. If your life was a manga or an anime, what would the title be and what would the soundtrack be? Ooh, <laughs> that is a fun question. What would my title be? Probably one of those silly long ones like Bitsy takes on the universe and stumbles a bunch of times, but eventually she gets there and we all cheer 12 times or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. Potentially that. Maybe something, maybe something like 
weird alien girl decides to conquer the world. Um, <laughs> and it would be pretty silly. And the soundtrack would be very strange. So, <laughs> I, I love weird music, like video game music, but not like not like the music in the video games, like a song somebody wrote about a video game, like nerdy, weird stuff. Professor Elemental and Steam Powered Giraffe yep. and what are some of those other ones like that just um, Charm. She does like World of Warcraft covers. Nice. I love that weird stuff, the nerdy stuff, <laughs> like the stuff you show people and they go, is that what is that? <laughs> like, ah, that's my that's my weird music taste. That is nice. maybe some K-pop thrown in for good measure. You have to. I mean, that's that's just a given. For me, there was, uh, I, and I love all those bands you mentioned as well too, because I've I, Steve, St um, Steam Power Giraffe. Steam Power Giraffe. I actually got to see them at Yumacon uh, uh, a while back. Uh, sorry, in in Detroit, there's a an, an anime manga convention called Yumacon, and it's a huge convention. So it's basically they take the Renaissance Center and they take Kobo Hall and they just make it like a, a massive two day event, and it's just like. Pretty incredible, to be honest, That's for awesome. downtown core. And so Steam Power Draft was actually there. Like they, they were signing CDs and I think they yeah. had a quick concert or whatever too. And it was pretty awesome. So they're um, so good live. I've seen them once in San Diego yeah. uh, for my birthday. We went and uh, I got to shake everybody's hands. I made a leather bracer and I had them all sign it. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. <laughs> uh, it was a lot of fun. They're so good live, man. I love that band. I one of my big goals is to do an anime. So I've got this this dream project I've had since like I 2012, and uh, I haven't really done any work on it yet because I'm not I'm not good enough. I have to rise to the challenge. But that anime for that for that project, I want them to be the opening and ending like songs. Like that's huge goals. It's like, you have to let me use your stuff for this opening and ending. It's just, I've dreamt about it for so long. Or get them to make their own custom. That'd be cool too. Ooh. <laughs> you have long-term goals and plans. And unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go into those this time around, maybe the next time around, because I do hate to say this, Betsy, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks uh -huh. Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I do greatly appreciate it. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. This is one of the more uh, in-depth interviews I've ever been on, and I really enjoyed it. I like the questions you asked. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. From one podcaster to another, I, I do greatly appreciate that. Before I let you go, where can we find you and how can we support you on social media and, of course, websites that you may have as well, too? Uh, so I am at Instagram and Facebook at Bitsy underscore the underscore alien. I think my Twitter is on here. It's the Bitzer. So that's my that's my gamer tag. It's also my like on Steam and it's hard to pronounce, which is why I've started going by Bitsy the Alien, because <laughs> the Bitzer is like older. But um, I also have a public Facebook account that you can follow. I'm most active there because I've got a lot of peers and we're always talking about new Kickstarters and loving each other's work. And my, my podcast, brand new, can't forget about that. Uh, Isakai uh, Production Studios, we have a brand new YouTube channel. And I think it's just called Isakai. So it's three eyes and then Sekai, <laughs> which means it's basically, I took the word for good and isekai and smashed them together. So good worlds, awesome worlds and uh, isekai interviews. Yeah. Watch those. If you like podcasts, they're also on Spotify and other things. Cause that's cool. Why not? Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. And you can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And that's a lot more updated than our website because I'm only one person, so I can only do so much. As I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.